I'm Jason Bellamy coming from you, coming to you from CSM 2018. We're live again, and I'm joined this time by Johnny Owens and Stefani Bell. And we're going to talk about BFR, blood flow restriction training, which has become this um, somewhat niche thing to maybe this growing mainstream thing, and I want to kind of chart that. Um, Johnny, let's just start absolutely simplest first. What are we talking about when we're talking about BFR? What is it? Probably the the simplest definition is it's applying a, a tourniquet to the to the upper leg or the upper arm, cutting off blood flow while you do or don't do exercise to try and create a, uh, a significant change in muscle size, muscle strength, lots of other kind of um, anabolic cascade factors at a very, very low weight, which is kind of key to this. It's, it's a weight that we typically do in rehab. So you've been one of the, the trailblazer bringing this into the country, basically. Um, give me the short version of how you became aware of this, got interested in this, and thought this could work. So um, I, I was with the Department of Defense, and we we're having uh, one group that we were really having problems with, and that was our blast trauma uh, guys and girls that, had, that were limb salvage. They were trying to avoid amputation. Um, so we needed a way to try and, and increase muscle size and strengthen them, or they would go on to amputation. And so we had all sorts of programs looking at that, and, and, and that was our kind of first group we, we focused it on. And, and, and that was, you know, geez, you know, probably six or seven years ago now. Um, and then we had two other groups there. We had one group who lost chunks of muscle, and we were doing regenerative medicine techniques to see if we could regrow lost muscle tissue. And then lastly, our sports med population. So those are the three within the military um, is, is where we kind of spearheaded this to see uh, how it would work. And so, so that's how I, I came to it. So, Stefania, how have you watched this grow, right? So we go from limb salvage to elite athletes trying to maximize uh, everything that they can do relying on this. Where, where kind of is this now in the spectrum? Well, it's amazing the growth in just a few years. And they literally did go, I think, from limb salvage to elite athletes because I met Johnny uh, when we were doing a piece for ESPN for uh, Veterans Day. And we were down at the Center for the Intrepid. We saw that they were using this. And I was completely unfamiliar with it. So uh, Johnny educated me on it. And he had obviously done so much research and you know it wasn't a fad they, they were doing studies currently with both military and civilians they were getting amazing results and so we sort of brought it to the public in sharing what they were able to do with their um with the veterans and from there we asked the question you know these are the most elite athletes in the world the wounded warriors they are the elite athletes so if it's good enough for them and the science supports it it's got to be good enough for you know regular athletes right and so we started asking that question i think people were intrigued when we exposed them to it and literally the first big case was one a member of the houston texans and uh Genevian clowney and he got injured and it was a cartilage procedure where one of the big concerns is these guys lose so much muscle mass because they can't strengthen and so we thought this might be a really good opportunity for them you know and they benefited because they were in houston he was in san antonio and they got together and um the team physician for the Texans wanted to test it out and so he essentially became the test case for athletes and the buzz just ramped up from there he did very very well pretty soon it was across the NFL then it was Major League Baseball NBA NHL and literally it's been what four or five years now since we did that first bit and it's exploded and now it's not only professional athletes you see a lot of the college athletes I mean it's it's all the D1 schools, they're doing it. So now I think people have seen so much benefit from it, they feel like they'll be behind if they don't do it. And clinicians, as they get more educated in it, are using it on a whole spectrum of patients. I mean, we thought it was athletes, but as Johnny can certainly tell you, it's, you know, it's, we're making forays into cardiac rehab, and uh, you know, they're working with elderly population. Like, the spectrum of who can benefit from it is huge. So Johnny, I mean, kind of keeping with that, you know, that's a great description of the momentum and how it's changed. So where are we in inching beyond that elite level athlete? Uh, try and give me a sense of that. And, and considering how rapid this has been already, yeah. how rapid, what's the next four years going to look like? What's your best guess? Yeah, so <clears throat> it, it's, it's crazy and it keeps getting more and more rapid. And so, for instance, our talk, you know, here, here in just a bit is about, you know, using this with um, you know, cardiac comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factors and, 
you know, we just lay out, man, there's all these potential things that are going to help them. There's these unknowns. Are, are we sure it's going to be safe? And we really think it is. But, I mean, we're, we're looking at basically that sarcopenic population, the, the baby boomers. Um, I think that's the real target. And if you look at kind of the tea leaves of where is all the research being focused looking at this right now, it's how can we help the, the elderly sarcopenic orthopedic patient, diabetic patient, hypertensive patient. Because there's a lot of pathways that we're going to be able to manipulate with this. And I think it's going to take therapy to this kind of different scientific level when we're doing exercise to can we create an angiogenic response to create capillary beds and muscle to maybe reduce hypertensive rates and those are the things that I think we're looking at um, it's going global you know we, we have we're training groups around the world now we have a, a medical research and scientific advisory council um, to, to kind of tie in our, our research efforts so um, going forward, I, th I think there's a lot of populations we're looking at. There's a lot of unknowns uh, we don't know yet. Um, and, I, and I think we really want to start getting the insurance payers to, to see that, you know, we have the support of the orthopedic community, we have the support of the research community. Um, our clinical side is very supportive of it. Already, it, for, for all the professional leagues on workers' comp, if they get a prescription, the players get blood flow restriction devices. Um, they, they get to use it during their rehab in the professional world. The, the secondary college insurances have just picked it up as well. Chubb Insurance, the biggest insurance provider in the world, has, has reached out and said, can this move into the workers' comp realm because they cover the, the professional leagues. So I, I think the insurance payers are really perking their ears up like, wow, this looks like it has some legs. And so we hope that's, that helps our profession as a whole. So I want to think about the appeal of this. And, you know, Stefania, when, when you talk to athletes, I'm sure they're always wanting the, the latest, greatest thing. And to some degree, cool factor is part of that. But when you're talking about um, limb salvage, right, it makes sense that these people need a lighter load and be able to have the similar effects. When I think of an elite level athlete, I think like, well, okay, it makes sense, but there may be potentially less in, in desperate need of that. What are they seeing as the benefit? What's drawing them to this um, right now and why is it becoming so much more popular? Is it just that the results speak for themselves? Uh it's funny because you hit the nail on the head of people like, oh, the latest, greatest. So if, like, with the Texans, guys who saw Jadavian get a good result, they're like, oh, I want to do what he's doing. So there's definitely some of that. Um, or they're the opposite. You know, it's a light load workout. These guys are used to pushing heavy weights. So there's a lot of skepticism, like, oh, I, you know, that's not going to be a big deal. But as anyone who's tried it knows, it's incredibly difficult workout. So it's very deceptive. You know, you're working at a light load but you're exhausted, you're dripping sweat while you're doing it. So then it becomes a challenge factor. So they may not be taking in all this science necessarily, but they see those things as challenging and motivating. And then once they get into it, I've heard things like, you know, for example, baseball pitchers who are always trying to find ways to maintain themselves and do workouts, but not exhaust themselves when they have to pitch or are worried about lifting heavy during a season because they're worried that's going to compromise their arm when they get down into the you know the long days ahead and so they've found something alternate not just from injury recovery standpoint but they're starting to look at it as a workout uh, option for them and a lot of the leagues are going you know they're going so long especially if they get into playoffs we've seen nba teams say you know we're going to scale back our heavy lifting as we get towards the playoffs and which their playoffs are april may june potentially uh, and we're just going to go with the blood flow restriction training and scale back the heavy lifting. So almost to mitigate some of the risk factors that happen with fatigue and long season. When we talk about the rapid growth and we look at that, if we imagine a situation where um, the, the non-elite athlete, the person who's got a problem, who just needs help, is there reason to think that this essentially accelerates it, uh, accelerates the healing, accelerates the strengthening? Because that's obviously one of the barriers, everyday barriers to physical therapy, right? Mm -hmm. It works, but it takes a certain time investment. Right. Or do we have reason to think that that's going to help that time gap problem potentially as physical therapy evolves for the everyday person that needs needs that help? Yeah, we hope so. And and so, I, and I think getting back onto this light load problem, we have more and more data that's coming out that's saying the acuteness of your injury is a valuable window. And and so, unfortunately. That, that acute period is, is really a lost time. You know, we're, we do things like work on range, maybe work on pain, but really powerful data showing that the muscle changes completely, that fibrosis happens, and, and that happens very, very rapidly. And so, um, you know, a, a, a groundbreaking ACL study came out, and after you tear your ACL, if you look at the quad, you biopsy it, 
it's full of fibrosis almost immediately. The, the stem cells, which are the things that, that regulate long-term growth and repair, they're significantly blunted. They did rehab for, for six months and repeated that biopsy, and it, and it was almost the, the exact same thing. So even that rehab window didn't get them back to, to what the true muscle was. Um, and that's, that's why a problem we have is people never really get to 100% lots of times. Now, and that was in JBJS and JLR. So the orthopedic surgeons are looking at that. You know, there's a, there's a humongous NIH-funded ACL trial um, with BFR right now looking to repeat that study. And can we, can we early on tap into those pathways and, and acutely make changes? Because I, I think once we miss that acute window, and we learned that with blast trauma, once that acute window's gone, we're, we're kind of halfway to, to done. I think the other thing is you're starting to find out that um, there's some pain mitigation yeah. with BFR. So people where we may have thought beforehand, well, they're too painful to do X, Y, or Z, that may be uh, doing therapy in conjunction with BFR, you're actually providing a window where there's pain relief and you can actually do neuromuscular re-education. I mean, it doesn't even have to be with the purpose of strength training, but just getting normal movement patterns back and restoring that before they fall by the yeah, wayside. We were very concerned that we were going to cause more pain with BFR post-injury. And, and it was the complete opposite. And, and, and now more papers are coming out and confirming that as well as some of our own that it actually mitigates pain more than, than just standard of care. So all the signs point to this continuing to be an area of positive rapid growth. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got, we're gonna have more people who want to consume this. Mm -hmm. So how do they find enough people who can supply safe BFR. So, Stefani, I'll, I'll to get your take on it first. I mean, you know, this is not something people are leaving PT school um, well versed in. So, so what's what's the next step for our profession? Well, I think the the key word that you used is safe. You know, one of the things about the way that Johnny and his group have done it is that it's an FDA approved device. They've gone through all the proper channels. There are safety measures in place. Tourniquets have automatic shutoffs. They're using a Doppler so that the pressures are accurate. And I think. People will see there are a variety of these type of systems that exist out there, but to me, it's safety first when you're dealing with the patient. So by all means, I would want to choose uh, the, the, the tool, if you will, that's the safest, that has all the safeguards in it, because there's a lot of literature on tourniquet safety in general, but with certain parameters. And so I really, I, I would suggest this type of Doppler tourniquet as the means of, of doing blood flow restriction training and not something that you can, I mean, you can go on Amazon and find things that will occlude blood flow that may not be safe. So the first thing is be That's smart about it. Right. 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 Especially because as you say, it's growing and people want something that they can access quickly. But uh, right now it's better to be safe and take time. And, and for that, Johnny, I would defer to you on how you how you go about it. Yeah, I, I will agree 100% obviously. And so um, we, what, what our tourniquet experts, our physiologists at the DOD and, and JAG came down and said, look, you know, call a spade a spade. You guys are stopping blood flow um, temporarily in a person. So whatever they do up in the OR suites, you follow the same rules. Y'all can't pretend like you're different. These are patients and you're doing what they're doing. So they said, look, here's all the decades of how to do this safely and properly. And we said, fine, um, that, that sounds perfect. And we'll do that. And so we followed every safe tourniquet guideline there is. We're probably more safe than they are in the ORs with the, with the way we practice it because it's new. Um, and, and we have a terrible uh, kind of reputation or, or way in therapy of, of non-standardizing what we do. You know, it's like, you did this and you did that, and I don't know really what was what. The way we want to do this, it's very standardizable. So I did a Doppler. I had this much percentage blood out. You did this much. We tracked it. That's the change we had. And then we know, okay, you affected that pathway. That becomes very powerful to the insurance payers. We're standardizing this. We have this science-based foundation. You know, my... my, my my um, bib list is almost at 800 papers on this now. Science says this is powerful. These clinical trials are saying it's powerful. We're standardizing it. Insurance payers, look at this. And then, I, and I think we we have this ripe opportunity to own this. You know, the orthopedic surgeons want us to do it. You know, we have a huge group in LA that only send their patients to clinics that are certified and are doing BFR now. Um, and so now's our chance. <laughs> if we just say, well, we just buy whatever's on Amazon and just go at it. I mean, we're a, a, a personal trainer can do that, you know, and, and, and obviously um, I, I think we have a ripe window we got to take advantage of. BFR, blood flow restriction, one of the things they're talking about here at CSM 2018. For Stefania Bell and Johnny Owens, I'm Jason Bellamy. We'll catch you later.